My name is Raymond Cass. Mysterious voices speaking in unknown tongues were picked up by Army and Air Force units in Norway and Sweden in the 1930s, reaching a peak in March 1934 when they abruptly ceased. Suspecting the Nazis, a search in German archives after the war failed to turn up any evidence of German involvement. Radio hams all over the world were picking up strange signals, but in the absence of tape recorders, these rather fleeting voices were lost. After the war and in the 50s, when tape recorders became common household articles, these strange voices were occasionally tracked and studied revealing odd characteristics. A leading German linguistics expert and translator of Russian classics said the following about the voices. At first these voices give the impression that they don't know how to speak properly, as if they were stumbling through alien languages they hadn't quite mastered. These were the famous polyglot voices a mixture of tongues in one sentence. Nowhere in the world are polyglot voices transmitted by normal broadcasting stations. Two pioneers, Konstantin Raudiva, a Latvian psychologist, and Friedrich Jorgensen, a Swedish filmmaker, sensed a revolutionary new development and started a series of experiments culminating in the recording of over 20,000 paranormal voices. Today, in 1995, over 5 million voices have been recorded worldwide, not by any one person, but by hundreds of experimenters, not to mention many spontaneous pickups by ordinary members of the public who find on their tapes uninvited guests in the form of mysterious interventions by male and female voices, sometimes addressing the astonished listener by his name. The voices come over an open mic or using a radio between stations on silent frequencies. When they address you by name, you know you're not picking up stray radio signals. Many experimenters have carried on conversations with these entities. They seem to emanate from a parallel universe, a mirror world of our own. They vary in loudness, from mere whispers to loud voices at room volume. Their mode of communication is shrouded in mystery, but scientists are exper experimenting with advanced equipment in an effort to stabilize them. A former Ministry of Defense scientist Golda Els, theorized that they were influenced by atmospheric anomalies and what he called geophysical conditions. A technician of the American Electronic Warfare Directorate wrote to me, Dear Raymond, thank you for sharing with us your opinions concerning the origin of the voices. Your comments carry much soundness and weight. Yours sincerely, Philip Paul. So how to obtain the voices? If three or four persons sit round a table with a recorder and an open mic and carried on a slow and measured conversation, leaving some gaps in the conversation, strange voices may intervene on playback between the words of the sitters. The tape should be studied carefully. Using the radio, a silent interfrequency should be used short wave, medium wave, and the air band may be tried. Voices can arise suddenly. They are mostly soft and rapid, often with lyrical overtones. Female voices are siren-like and entrancing. Here's a female of unknown origin lamenting our preoccupation with war and conflict. I say this, she sings, facing all the sorrows, this are yours. This are yours should, of course, 
be these are yours, but in each voice utterance there are certain mistakes and anomalies. Here she is. In other words, you're the architects of your own troubles. The EVP pioneer, Constantine Raudiva, known to his friends as Costa, died in 1974, and his voice has been recorded since then by experimenters all over the world. His one-time girlfriend, Sonia Lipina, who died tragically in Riga in 1958, sang lustily on my tapes one day in 1975 and Rowdy was so pleased that he followed up and exclaimed in polyglot, polyglot Ach, wie nice Costa. Costa was his nickname. Oh, how nice Costa. Again we have the polyglot, the use of more than one language in a sentence. <laughs> The voice of Constantine Raudiva, recorded a year after his passing. A rather plaintive female sings in not quite correct German, Aus Mystisches, du schließt mich aus, from the spirit world, you close us out. She now gives a benediction, peace, in English. Sometimes the EVP experimenter picks up snatches of conversation, probably not meant for his ears, like the following. Mabel is picking me up message in Unaby. Ask where is Unaby? The answer came, Pustansev in Bugaby. Again note the polyglot. Наряду с такими относительно невинными игры. Наряду с такими относительно невинными игры. В станциях им выгоднее. В станциях им выгоднее. Константин Раудив died unexpectedly in 1974. Six months previously, I'd recorded an ominous voice in archaic German, that is to say, not in the modern idiom, saying, Raudiv, strong as oak, towards the grave. A very somber voice. I took the precaution of sending copies to three independent researchers. Here's the voice in German. Eichenstark Raudiv, a regional accent, zum Grabmals, to the tomb. The owner of the voice, not known. But the prediction came true. In nineteen seventy, we lived in an apartment overlooking the broad sweep of Bridlington Bay and opposite Flamborough Head. And one morning, after an overnight storm, 
we picked up an ancient piece of oak in the shape of a shark. We took it home, and even now it occupies pride of place above our mantelpiece. We wondered from what wreck it came, as the area around Flamborough Head is littered with the debris of ships. We were tuned to an empty frequency when a female voice exclaimed, Hector! We consulted maritime records, and sure enough, the vessel Hector went down off Flamborough Head in February 1801. Examination of the wood showed an age in excess of 200 years. Leaving my apparatus in the hands of my assistant, one day in 1973, I set off for Scarborough to a sub-office. On my return, I found a strange, foreign-sounding voice on my tape. High-pitched and fast, the voice shouted, Cass away, busy in Scarborough. Listen, Hoch Baba, Hoch means exalted. Hoch Baba is slowly coming and teaches the world. The voice irritated me a little. Eight years later, I received a cassette from India, a lecture by the Indian guru, Sai Baba. The voice was identical. Here I'm going to play the paranormal voice and match it with a brief extract from the Baba lecture. What is important is the mention of my name, which precludes random radio pickup. Who is the richest man in this world? He who has much satisfaction is the richest man. Who is the poorest man in this world? He has much desire. He is the poorest man. Who is the richest man in this world? He who has much satisfaction is the richest man. Who is the poorest man in this world? He has much desire. He is the poorest man. The voice of Satya Sai Baba. At the time when the Busy with Scarborough voice was received, Baba was virtually unknown in this country, except for the publication of a couple of books. He had only a handful of devotees. But eight years later, in 1980, his followers established a centre in London, and literature and tapes became available. Baba is credited, like Father Pio, with the power of bilocation and the bringing about of physical effects in the home of his devotees, a common one being the materialization of sacred ash, vibhuti, in sealed picture frames containing his photo. Distant healings are commonplace, and the Swami is said to be aware of the inmost thoughts of his devotees. Note the words slowly coming to teach the world. In a book by a psychiatrist, written at least five years after we received that voice, the question of his imminent triumph was put to him. But his answer was identical with our voice. The new era would be ushered in only slowly and very gradually. I was also able to capture some of Raudiv's friends on the other side. For instance, Sonia Lipina, with whom he concluded a survival pact before her death in Riga in 1958. She did, in fact, keep her side of the bargain with Costa. That's Raudiv's constant nickname. And here she is on that summer afternoon, years later in Hull, singing Only Sonia Will Make It. A 
and on a previous occasion, with a note of triumph in her voice, Ray Cass, I've made it. One afternoon, in the early days of our experiments, probably in 1974, I agreed with my assistant, Miss Feuchter, that we should try simultaneous experiments in separate parts of the building, synchronizing at 2 p.m. Unknown to me, she delayed her start by about 10 minutes whilst making a copy of an Elvis tape on two machines. But downstairs, I received the following voice. She loves Elvis. Das wird not. She loves Elvis, then the German bit, which translates as that was noted, or she loves Elvis, we noted that. Listen carefully to the female voice, or voices. This led later to an irritated comment by a Ministry of Defence official, which interview I shall describe in a few minutes. She loves Elvis, says the girl's voice, and then two voices chorus, Das wird not. That's fragmented German. It's been interpreted as, it is noted. And in our London studio, Mr. Patrick Stevens, who's the Assistant Secretary in the Air Force Department of the Ministry of Defence. Can I ask you, Mr. Stevens, in London, what do you think about this polyglot claim? Well, it's very difficult. Uh, all I got there was a bit of atmospherics and a couple of words which might have come from any anywhere. Mm. And uh, I have no idea what they were or what was said. So, one radio commentator had no difficult difficulty at all in hearing and understanding that voice. But Patrick Stevens of the Ministry of Defence heard only atmospherics and a couple of words, which he failed to understand. I rather think, however, that these remarks were for popular consumption, because a short time afterwards I received two separate visits from a Ministry of Defence scientist requesting voice examples. This person was connected with GCHQ, and a listening post in Darmstadt, Germany. He promised to clean up my tapes by a digital process, eliminating the static and enhancing the actual voices. I handed him a number of examples, but of course never heard from him again, and never received a copy of the digitalized tapes. We now come to a further selection of voices, and I'd like to draw your attention to the polyglot nature of the speech. No radio station in the world broadcasts in mixed languages or tampers with sentence construction and grammar as do the voices. My own view is that voice samples couched in perfect English or any other language would be indistinguishable from normal broadcasts. Therefore, an utterance couched in the style of the entities with all the anomalies suggests immediately paranormality. Here's a female addressing me first in an unknown tongue but lapsing into English, saying, so strange, remember you. So strange, remember you. She seems to be expressing puzzlement at the contact. She sounds like a Polish girl I knew in 1943, whilst a prisoner in a German camp. <laughs> A male voice intervenes and proclaims, We are dreams. Do the dead live a dreamlike -like existence, or are we the dream and they the reality? Some mysterious female voices may be technicians appear to teach a, a communicator how to articulate. 
she manages to gasp out the word evidence, evidence, and then in a choked voice, Emmy. I had a relative, Emmy, who had died a few years previously of cancer. Una, O, H, M, E, significa sí, y M, Una O H M E significa sí y Una O H M E significa sí y Una O H M E significa sí y M Finally, one of the voices says, I'm in Georgeskov. This may be Emmy speaking, but Georgeskov sounds Slavonic. In hundreds of Raudiv's tapes, place names, some unknown and a few known, are mentioned by voice entities. The following voice, though in German, contains useful internal evidence of paranormality and a link with Jürgensen. Jürgensen had been a friend of Felix Kersten, Himmler's masseur. Kersten, after his death, manifested on Jürgensen's tapes, and there seems to have been a close tie between them. Here is Kersten manifesting on my tapes. He says, Kersten, Deutschen by Frederick. Frederick was one of Jürgensen's popular nicknames. He was variously called Freddy, Frederick, or Frederico. Kersten, Deutschen by Frederick, means Germans visited Frederick. I discovered much later that a party of German parapsychologists had visited Jürgensen in Sweden to carry out experiments. Here's the voice, Kersten, a Deutschen by Frederick. Here's a strange polyglot mixture. A male voice says, Honey, that's a German name, Honey, here lies Dawson, British and Major, English and German. It should, of course, be Honey, here lies a British Major Dawson. There must have been many Major Dawsons killed in two world wars. I wonder which this one is, and who is Honey? Notice the stilted style of that announcement. Here's another one. This time he says, Here is der Sistronatus. Here is Sistronatus. This sounds Latin. Here is der Sistronatus is correct German word order. They would use the definite article before a name. For instance, here is the Raymond. We would omit that. Now, a rather melancholy female commences to sing with the benediction, Peace. And then after a moment or so, Aus mystisches, du schließt mich aus. And then regretfully, Busy. Out of the spirit world, you close me out. Busy. This seems to be a Mary-type voice, singing in not quite correct German, but with enormous feeling. Aus mystisches, Du schließt mich aus, out of the spirit world, you close me out, you're too busy.
At one point, I was in the habit of picking up voices by tuning into a West German transmitter at a few minutes past midnight at night when the voice would blot out the station and sometimes pop in a message. Here's an example. The voice breaks into the music and says, put it there on ice, I'll mend your feet, he means I'll mend your feet. At that time, I was suffering a lot of pain in the feet and he was also asking me to put the whole thing on ice. I badly needed a rest from the strain of this work and the heavy correspondence it engendered from all parts of the world. Here's the voice breaking into the music. Put it there on ice. I'll mend the fusa. <laughs> A German electronics expert, Hans Otto Koenig, took his generator, so-called, over the border from Germany to Luxembourg in pieces. He was afraid he may have trouble at the customs. He reassembled it under the watchful eyes of the Radio Luxembourg technicians, and under supervision, paranormal voices were obtained, the most startling being a female voice saying, Wir hören deine Stimme, we hear your voice. Radio Luxembourg sacrificed many hours of airtime to an examination of the EVP. Of course, as there are literally hundreds of experimenters in West Germany, listeners' examples were played by the dozen. And my voices, whilst maybe a novelty in the UK, are considered only routine by the Germans. Here's this voice example. You'll hear the Luxembourg announcer speaking in German, and then Hans Otto Koenig with his preamble, and the voice breaking in, Wir hören deine Stimme, a female voice. The Stimme meines Gastes here, der sagt, ich glaub, ich hab die richtige Frequenz. Darauf kommt eine paranormale Stimme, also eine Stimme aus dem Jenseits, die sagt, Wir hören deine Stimme. Wir führen Ihnen das jetzt dreimal hintereinander vor. Wir hören deine Stimme. 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 They didn't, however, stop at the end of the war, and since then, well over half a million of them have been heard all over the world. Some have been recorded. That's said to be the voice of Sonja Liepener, singing, Only Sonja Will Make It. She's referring to a survival pact she made with her boyfriend, Konstantin Raudive, who was one of the first researchers into EVP. It was recorded long after her death. So also was Raudive's ecstatic reply, which, like many of these messages, is in polyglot, a mixture of languages. In this case, English and German. Ach, wie nice, he says. Oh, how nice. Listen again. That was recorded on a quite different occasion, but both recordings were made in Hull by Raymond Cass, who's been listening in for some six years now. His original interest in electronic voice phenomena came from reading Konstantin Raudiva's book, Breakthrough. And he gets most of his messages when he tunes into 127 megahertz in the VHF wave band. My friend, Philip Larkin, 
the poet and librarian at Hull University, was an out-and-out -out materialist with absolutely no religious leanings. He died tragically of cancer. Just a fortnight before his death, I received his last letter, dictated on his sickbed. Six months after his death, I wondered how he was faring in the beyond, assuming that there is a life after death. The answer came in his sonorous voice, tramping. It was his habit to tramp alone in graveyards and churchyards in East Yorkshire. The Catholics call it limbo, the in-between state where the souls of the dead seek orientation. Later, a quotation from Sir Winston Churchill came into my hands, and I quote, Only a faith in life after death where loved ones meet again, and the healing tramp of time